the most fundamental function of the brain is to serve the body. Now it's easy to say, it's more difficult to demonstrate. Uh, I try to demonstrate it with uh, these keywords that I have here, mental function, sleep and obesity. There are very large uh, epidemiological studies showing a strong connection between obesity, type 2 diabetes and sleep. However, we don't exactly understand how this happens. It's easy to say that if you are obese, you don't sleep well. But what I'd like to convince you today is the arrow, the causality or the direction may be the other way around. So this is a, a what we can call a vicious circle or vicious cycle because if you don't sleep well, then something happens during eight hours of your night that reorganizes brain activity that can have a tremendous impact on your daily activities. Now, in order to understand this, or at least get some ideas about how this might occur, I have to travel back at least four decades of neuroscience. And of course, we didn't start out, at least my group didn't start out studying this very complicated picture. We were doing something else. My laboratory is very much interested in how memory works, how sleep affects memory, and the key structure of this process is the hippocampus. And uh, most of the work that we do in the laboratory deals with how the hippocampus communicates with the partners, especially how the neocortex is activated. Of course, this dialogue or this, uh, this sentinel function of the hippocampus goes on continuously both during the waking state as well as during idling time, including sleep. Let me just show you one interesting example to increase your curiosity how the spiking activity of this structure here, the hippocampus, can have a, a nice impression on the experimenter and perhaps on the rest of the brain. So what you see here are these ticks of action potentials of 30 different neurons colored differently. And uh, the, the animal that uh, we are recording from is uh, doing a very simple task, just running back and forth in a linear track. And as you can see from uh, this illustration, uh, the activity goes from the blue neuron to the red neuron. These are very well-known cells called place cells. That is every single hippocampal neuron potentially under some condition can be married or can be associated with one particular part of the environment. A Nobel Prize was given for this discovery. It's, uh, it's a very robust and interesting phenomenon. Now, what you see also is that there are some temporal relationships among the spikes and that, that packaging, that syntactical operation is assisted by a ongoing dynamic which is called hippocampal theta oscillation. This is a rhythmic pattern anywhere between 8 to 10 hertz and you will see when I zoom in that indeed there is a nice interaction how these spikes, we can call them uh, neuronal letters, are concatenated in neuronal words by disciples and the entire journey can be conceived of as a, a neuronal sentence when the animal goes from here to the very end. Now the interesting thing that we have discovered, or have seen, is that at the beginning of the journey, the same neurons, the same sequence here, will be seen even though the animal is just sitting here at the beginning of the track. And if I zoom in here, you will see that actually this pattern is also a sequence and in fact it's in the same direction as the other pattern, the much slower pattern, so the difference between here is these are two seconds, this is eight seconds, the whole thing here is 200 milliseconds, so if this is four seconds and 200 milliseconds, it's a large temporal compression. And if we look at the local field potential expression, that there is a pattern here, it's called hippocampal sharp wave ripple. This is the keyword of my talk, please. Remember that ripple activity, which is the, uh, uh, the which is a synchronous pattern and a organizer of hippocampal fast sequences or fast sequences in the hippocampus. Now, the amazing thing that after the journey, you will see this pattern again. Here is another sharp wave, but now the activity goes in the opposite direction. Um, just to summarize many years of research, you can say prior to action, there is a pre-conscious or subconscious, if you want, preparation of the brains 
starting perhaps in the hippocampus. And this is reflected by this fast replay or preplay of neural activity in the same direction as the unfolding exploration will be associated with. And you can call it planning, prediction, future imagination, or many other words. And at the end of the journey, you will see exactly the same kind of pattern, but now it's in a reverse direction. And you can call it replay, or memory, or post-diction, or the past. Now, you can hear it also if I play you this same exact pattern that you have just seen. And I associate link every single action potential key of a piano. So here was a nice sharp wave ripple at the beginning of the journey. You can see very nicely that the animal is started, it was still here, but it will start moving. And that was a 200 millisecond pattern. Now let's go on. The animal starts moving, the pattern changes. just move forward and then you can see that the end of the journey the animal is sitting rewarded by water reward and then at the very end there will be the last ripple which is a reverse replay here so well, I you know many laboratories are trying to decipher how is this uh, beautiful temporal organization occurs in the hippocampus and how what kind of functions it might serve and the answer is that this is this pattern is responsible for many things including our memory consolidation now, this pattern is uh, not only present in the rodent, but is present in any, every mammal invested so far, investigated so far, and in the same manner and the same temporal dynamic, pretty much the same frequency and the same duration. And the important part of this is that it's not only present after the animal is rewarded, but the same kind of pattern, the sharp wave ripple pattern, can occur in our non-REM sleep every single night, and there are about two to 4,000 of them. What they do is they do us a favor, namely, once we learn something and we, we have an experience only a single time, then fragments of this experience are replayed for free during the night so many times. This is probably the explanation how a single shot memory, an episode, can be remembered for such a long time. Now, of course, this pattern is not alone. It is interacting with other patterns in the brain, such as sleep spindles, the up and down state or slow oscillations in the brain. But the illustration here shows you nicely that during non-REM sleep, you have many, many more than during waking pattern. So they do something special. How they are organized, there is a whole consortium of other types of neurons called inhibitory interneurons. And I just show here a laundry list of the many types of interneurons present in the cortex, including in the hippocampus, whose goal is nothing else just to guide the traffic of the action potentials of the principal cells of pyramidal cells in the right direction. So the interneurons are the traffic lights of the brain that allow that the message, the, the messages go in the right direction and in the right speed. Now, as I mentioned, there are many experiments showing you know, at least a correlative evidence or correlative support for the idea that this pattern is important in memory consolidation. But now let's challenge that and do an experiment that actually shows it even more positively or more directly. So again, here you see a, uh, a nice uh, ripple, 200 hertz or so, 150 hertz activity. And what we can do is we can say, uh, or we can ask is that what happens if we artificially prolong the activity of this uh, uh, population pattern? And the reason why we did that is because we observed previously that when the animal learns a new task or when the animal have a correct performance, the duration of these sharper ripples are longer than in a 
in a familiar environment or when the animal makes an error. So we were curious to see what happens if several hundred times, or in fact a thousand times in, a, in, an, in the experiment, we can prolong the pattern. And the answer is, the, the answer is that the consequences are good because the consequences are shown here at the red line. And these are daily performances of the animal. And on the y-axis, you see the memory performance. And it shows clearly that if you prolong the, actual, the sharp wave ripple duration and you prolong this activity, then it comes with a plus because memory is increasing by 10, 15%. And that's quite a bit of a game. We can play the uh, game in an opposite direction. Namely, we can erase these ripples completely during the post-experience uh, uh, sleep period and see what happens as a consequence of that. And now the red line here shows what happens uh, when you interfere with the ripples and then the performance is decreasing them. In other words, if, if I would erase the sharp wave ripple patterns in your brain during my talk, you will not be remember, you will not be able to remember much about what I have said tomorrow. So so far this is very good. Several laboratories in the world are working on this uh, complex problem, how memories are consolidated, how they are uh, modified during the night and so on. Now here is a little problem. The problem is this and was pointed out by evolutionary biologists also that oh, on sharp wave ripples we can call them, uh, and we do call them, a cognitive marker. However, it turns out that this pattern evolved a long, long, long time ago, probably a billion years ago. And this creature called the Australian dragon also has a ripple, but it has a very small neocortex. So you may wonder what is the function of this cognitive pattern in a creature that looks beautiful but does not really do a lot of uh, cognition computation. But the interesting thing of course is that whenever this sharp wave ripple happens as a, com as a result of the cooperative activity of many neurons in this CA3, CA2, and CA1 region of the hippocampus, the messages, the action potentials, not only go upward to the neocortex and read out by reading out the content of the sharp wave, but at the same time, the action, the action collaterals of the same neurons from here to here fan in and go downstream somewhere. And they go to the lateral septum and also the hypothalamus. Now, also, I just showed you in the previous example how this fine structure is controlled. But you can also ask how this, this pattern is played out throughout the day. So these are several days here. As you can see, these are the light dark changes of day and night. And then we are plotting the incidence of the sharp wave ripples per minute. And you can see a nice fluctuation, not only during within the day and or day and night, but even within the day. These are the ultra dion or other the unchanges. So that's interesting because once we observed that and we wondered what type of other things there are in the body that may show a similar slow time scale fluctuation. And it turns out that blood glucose or the interstitial glucose also shows not only a circadian pattern but within this within the day and night there are these faster oscillations which is shown here and here and also here. So not only 24 hour fluctuations are present, but also 19 minute and 90 minute and 50 minute fluctuations occur in our peripheral glucose levels. And that has been known for quite some time. What hasn't been known is how this how the brain actually has something to do with it and how is it able to control what happens in the periphery. As I already mentioned, the hippocampus not only sends output upstream, but also by, the, by way of the lateral septum, a very dense projection to the hypothalamus. And lo and behold, when we plot both the fluctuations of the sharp wave ripples, 
as a as a as a density per minute and the peripheral glucose level, we see some correlation. This can be quantified, and you can see that this correlation is very powerful, especially at the, again in the 15 minutes, 90 minutes, or in somewhere in this range. We can express it or ask the question differently. Is there any impact of the peripheral, the peripheral glucose levels on the occurrence of shelf wave ripples in the hippocampus? And the answer is yes, very robust. This is the cycle time the, of, the, of the glucose levels. And this is the phase in which the probability of occurrence of the hippocampus shelf phase are present. And in each of the 30 rats that we tested, it shows a reliable relationship. We can show it in a different way, in time scale or in a time domain now. And you can see that shortly after the hippocampal ripple, the blood glucose levels decrease in the periphery. And it's shown here. The more dense, that is, the more frequently the ripples occur, the larger the decrease of the glucose level in the periphery. So this is, again, a correlation. How do we know that, in fact, this pattern has any real impact on it. One way to do that or approach that is to make these patterns artificially. So instead of prolonging it with optogenetic methods as I showed you earlier, we can now create these patterns. And every single time when we create a pattern, we can see what is the level of, of peripheral glucose. And the answer is that in each of these eight rats, as you can see, just like under spontaneous correlation, we can mimic that relationship by producing artificial ripples. Just to make sure that the hippocampus is critical and is more important than other structures, we can do the same game in the, in the, in the, in the uh, neocortical area above, and then we see nothing. So this was a perturbation experiment. We produced something positive, but of course the real thing is, is, uh, has to be explained yet, that if we assume that the regulatory pathway is hippocampus lateral septum, uh, the hypothalamus, and then the, the, the pancreas, of course, we have to block this pathway. So this is what we have done with a, a pharmacological method. This is the lateral septum, and then we show when the lateral septum is blocked by pharmacological means or pharmacogenetic means, then this regularly present glucose dip is completely abolished. To summarize what I had said so far, well, what I, I want to convey is that there is a pattern in the hippocampus, an important one, this is because this is the most synchronous pattern in the mammalian brain, serves as a memory device or that allows memory transfer and consolidation of information. Enhancing aborting these sharp wave ripple patterns can improve or deteriorate memories, um, as we have shown. But it turns out that the same pattern can have a subcortical impact Therefore, we showed that sharp wave ripple patterns can decrease glucose levels, and uh, we identify the pathway and the potential mechanism. And of course, the important message is that this may be the mechanism by which sleep disturbances can be important in inducing obesity and perhaps type 2 diabetes. But perhaps the side effect or a important side comment of this talk is that when evolution came up with a interesting pattern serving the body, that pattern can be reutilized, it can be repurposed for something more complicated such as cognition. If you think that this was not good enough explanation, then may I recommend this book that is uh, uh, ex explaining what I just said in uh, 300 pages. Thank you so much for your attention.